So today we're going to be talking about applications of DNA profiling. How can a DNA profile be used by a forensic scientist? So today we're going to go through some of the specific applications in terms of forensic investigations and other non-criminal uses. So firstly, let's go through some of the specific forensic investigations that, we, that DNA profiling can be used for. So first and most obvious would be linking suspects to a crime scene or a victim or a murder weapon, um, perhaps a, a vehicle of some kind used to transport the victim to a secondary crime scene, you name it. There's lots of variations on that. Ultimately, what you would be doing is comparing a reference DNA sample from the suspect to those that were collected from the crime scene or the victim or the item in question. It can also be used to identify the victim of crime because in certain situations, the body of the victim may be damaged beyond conventional identification techniques, or it may just be certain body parts as opposed to a complete body. In which case, if you're missing the, the, the head or you're missing hands, um, dental records or fingerprinting are not going to be of any use. Um, so a DNA profile or a DNA fingerprint can help to identify the victim or victims um, by comparison between the sample from the body to a reference sample from a, um, uh, from a missing person or from someone that they believe that it may, the victim may be. It can also be used to help link separate crimes that may be occurred in um, separate locations or may, over a passage of time, um, have not been linked by police due to a, so, or all sorts of circumstances. But the presence of the DNA evidence at separate crime scenes can help to provide a link of some kind between them. It can also be used to exonerate convicted criminals because DNA evidence um, and DNA profiling as a technique has only been around for all, just on 30 years now. So anyone who's convicted before that or even since then under different circumstances, um, this application may be relevant to their situation because um, other types of evidence um, such as eyewitness testimony or things like that can be um, inherently unreliable. And so um, application of modern DNA techniques um, has in certain situations cast doubt on a person's conviction and had it overturned so that they've been released and exonerated. Um, so some other non-forensic applications um, could be locating a missing person. So for example, an, an abducted baby obviously cannot conclusively, conclusively identify its parents. So the baby can be identified by comparing its DNA with those of its parents. Um, to help to confirm that that baby is indeed theirs. Um, another application that Australia is particularly involved in, given certain um, disasters that have happened in recent years, like September 11, but particularly for an Australian context, thinking about the Bali bombings in 2002, the Boxing Day tsunami in 2004, or the MH17 plane crash that happened in Ukraine. Um, DNA profiling is, is needed, is, is important to help identify the victims. So the same sort of processes within, that we talked about just before, comparing um, a sample from um, the, the body or body parts to a reference sample from a missing person, especially if family members believe that, um, that their missing person or their family member may have been involved, then they can submit a sample that can be used to compare against any, any bodies that, are, um, that have been found at the, at the scene. Um, so Australia has been very heavily involved in particular in the Bali bombings and the Boxing Day tsunami um, because of our expertise and our, also our proximity to, to where those events happened, um, particularly through our Australian Federal Police. Um, DNA profiling can also be useful in paternity testing. Um, so that is establishing the identification of the father of a child, especially if the father um, believes that they may not be the father of a given child, that they can test their DNA profile with their, that of the child, because a child will share half of its alleles with each parent. So every gene, every chromosome inside that child's cells will have one version from their mother and one version from their father. So if half of their alleles do not match up with the father, then he cannot be the biological father of the child. Forensic intelligence is another potential application of DNA profiling. So this is, rather than actually developing evidence to uh, prosecute someone in court, it's more actually when we're thinking about identification of a suspect um, based on particular physical characteristics that might be identified from their genome, such as their ethnicity, uh, hair colour, eye colour, height, or other distinctive physical features. Uh, so this can give the police particular directions that they can follow in terms of who to, to look at, 
and who to, to target for their investigation um, and, and, so, and then use further evidence to build it from there. Now, it is an area of current research. It's very much something that is being looked into really inclusively in order to more reliably determine someone's features. But it does pose many, many ethical issues, particularly around privacy, um, for people who are totally unrelated to a given investigation are essentially having their genome looked into by the police in order to find connections or perhaps find relatives or it, it can have very many unintended consequences um, and, and that's where a lot of the ethical issues tend to fall. Um, but and, and another non-forensic application of DNA profiling is what we call mitochondrial DNA because the mitochondria inside the cell contain their own separate DNA. Um, so this is DNA that's different from the chromosomes that exist inside the nucleus, and this DNA comes solely from the mother. Given that the, the zygote that forms when the sperm and the egg fuse, um, is, is so the, the ovum is a complete cell in itself. Um, it has half, you know, it's a haploid cell, it has half the DNA profile, but it has lots of other organelles inside it that allow it to survive, whereas the sperm is essentially um, the male's DNA inside a a vehicle to carry it where it needs to go during fertilization. And so there are mitochondria inside the ovum that um, contain information that's only from the mother. And this mitochondrial DNA is passed down in the maternal line, so from mother to child, um, through generations and generations. But it varies uh, relatively little compared with um, the chromosomes that exist inside the nucleus, which vary a lot from generation to generation. So by examination of the mitochondrial DNA, aside from the nuclear DNA, it allows determination of what we call maternal ancestry. So being able to trace back someone through generation to generation in the past through their mother's genetic line. Um, it can be really useful for identification of very old samples by comparison with distant descendants. For example, uh, being able to work out um, who are long lost descendants of say Genghis Khan or some other ancient uh, famous figure um, by comparison with their mitochondrial DNA and seeing that there is a, a, a lot in common with, um, with people from a long, long time ago, or perhaps also connections between very distant relatives um, today. 